First of all, I want to thank our local folks for allowing me to teach this again. Uh, this time we have visual confirmation that the audio is connected to the camera. That helps better. Uh, last thing we want is an hour of people trying to lip sync and figure out what I'm saying. You know, the last few weeks have been very dynamic. We have, we have seen a lot fall into place. Uh, the stuff at the Boise conference, I believe God did a lot of things. There was just a, a manifested presence of God at that conference. I uh, got to minister to a lot of people, talk with a lot of people, and just the hunger that is there. They, that's one of the things that's blessing me as I go to these conferences here in a couple of weeks. We have the one in Branson is the hunger people have to hear truth. The hunger not, not just to know what the enemy is doing, but to know how to walk with God. And that is essential for the days that we're living in. It's not just enough to know where we are in Bible prophecy. You know, I, I personally, guys, I think it would be tragic if God has called me to be that triumphant church, has called me to move in levels of the power of God, that are equal to the time that I'm living in. And I have not spent any time in my life preparing myself for that, but, I, I, but all I have done is figured out what the enemy's doing and know where I am on the prophetic chart. That's a, that would be a tragedy, wouldn't it? Because God's trying to develop his A-team. He's trying to develop the remnant in the last days that's going to be able to stand toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And guys... It, it, it's very apparent that's where we are. We, we're seeing uh, so much come up uh, in, within, within humanity of this hatred. I mean, it's, it's going everywhere from with the NAFTA. Uh, God actually set something up this, this last week or so that I thought was awesome. Because when they have their protests, they want to make sure all the liberals, reporters, don't have their cameras on. But they forgot there was one veteran liberal reporter that used to walk in the protest back in the 60s, 70s, or whatever. And he, he refused. And he's given commentary. And when he wrote his article, he said, I used to be a protester that would protest for, for, you know, for people's rights and this type of thing. But he said, when I looked in the eyes of a NAFTA, he said, I was frightened to my core. It, it scared me. And all of a sudden, now the left are, uh-oh. Although we've been supporting it, and George Soros has been paying for it, and we were counting on them doing their stuff, uh-oh, now we've got to come out and say that the president was right, that there's, there was evil on both sides, there was problem on both sides, there was violence on both sides, as well as finding out the guy that, uh, that rallied all the white supremacists together used to be a, an Obama supporter. He's a professional activist that did Occupy Wall Street. All of a sudden, the day that Trump became president, he became a white supremacist. Hmm. You see, we, we need to look beyond the theater they're pushing, and we've got to see from third heaven realities. And part of that, guys, that we're, we're doing, guys, what, what we have seen this last year and last few years is that the global agenda is in the new media. All the, all the media, all the... All the uh, traditional branches of, of, uh, of news have been taken over by globalism. The only thing that is opposing them is the new media coming up and what they label as alt-right. I just prefer to call it right because they are right. Trying to share what's going on. We've seen the political left has, have, have been given, have been risen in sedition. We see the political right have revealed that they had no intentions of keeping their campaign promises. How long did we hear about that they were going to repeal Obamacare? And when they actually had a president say, do it, they were, we're not prepared. You had eight years, dude. In other words, it's all theater because it's two legs of the same beast. Now, there is the rare conservative that may not be giving in on, on, on the side of the right, but the majority is this Washington B. Social media has revealed the hearts of many, even those that profess to be Christians, that it's alarming to me. Mary and I were talking about what's going on down in Houston, and I do not believe that it was the judgment of God. I do, I do see evidence of both uh, witchcraft. Mary and I talked about this in our last podcast and scalar energy. But, but we, we almost have, though, there are a lot of things in America that need to be judged. But I thank God can do it. 
in such a way that we don't end up being Mad Max and the Road Warrior, okay? There has to be a way of doing that for the sake of the remnant. He's not waking up all the remnant. But see, I, I think part of the problem is that when, when I taught on how man is made up as a tripartite being, we have spirit, soul, and body. And when man fell, the holy of holies within us that was connected to the third heaven went dark. It was disconnected. That's, death means disconnection. I'm separated from God. And so we've been living carnally and soulishly our entire lives. And as I pointed out in, in how, it, how it relates to the, to the three heavens, your soul can relate to the second heaven. And that's why principalities and powers can just manipulate us like we're, on, like we're puppets on a string. And we're used to moving in that. But what God is calling us to do, the moment that you were born again, the Holy Spirit came in and filled his temple. He came into that third heaven. And we've got to learn to live by the Spirit, which what's interesting, when you read here in Galatians, we're going to be getting into the fruit of the Spirit. It's not only abiding in the Holy Spirit, but it's learning how to function from your spirit first. We have got to, instead of out of the flesh and out of the carnal nature that has been trained by the first heaven, we, we are now connected back to the third heaven, which supersedes the second heaven and the first heaven. In fact, for the believer, when I get born again, the Holy Spirit moves on the inside of me. He has written God's law upon my heart. And then James told the early church, those that had accepted Messiah, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Because part of what really messes us up and keeps us in bondage and keeps us in, in, in whatever type of bondage, which emotional bondage, financial bondage, or whatever, so many times we think it's an external curse when we constantly sabotage ourselves because our spirit and our souls are out of alignment. Your spirit knows what is right. Your soul is programmed by the world. And so they're in conflict with one another, which agrees with what, with what Paul was sharing in Galatians 5. Because how many know your spirit and the Holy Spirit are in agreement because he's, he's talking to your spirit all the time. That's where, that's where I commune with the Almighty. And so you're trying to believe God, but your heart isn't in it because your spirit man knows you're living in conflict with the kingdom of God, the law of God, and everything that's about being a Christian. And what I see in, in so many of this, there's, there, is, there is an abiding, whether I'm abiding in the second heaven, which we're used to from the day that we're born, or I'm abiding in the third heaven, it produces fruit. Because man, it was man when God made us of the dust of the earth and we produce after our own kind, within every single one of us there is a field that can be planted in. That either I believe what the enemy is saying, I believe what the enemy is doing, and there are seeds that are planted that begin to raise up in the iniquity force and begin to destroy my life and I begin destroying everybody around me. Nobody knows people like that, do you, that they, they bless a room by leaving or getting out of a situation because they bring this, this cloud with them wherever they go. That's because there are seeds of principalities and powers in the kingdom of darkness, and they have never taken the time to renew their minds to the Word of God, to repent, pull out the old harvest, begin functioning from, the th from their spirit and the third heaven, from the throne of God, and begin planting the seeds of the Word of God in their hearts. I've heard Christians ask me, how come, Mike, how come I'm not getting on fire with God? You learn the secret with Elijah at Mount Carmel. Not only do you have to set things in order, here is the paradox of the kingdom. You cannot catch fire unless you're wet enough. Three times. He doused everything with water, the washing of the water of the word. And when it was thoroughly soaked, and kingdom fire came. Oh, that'll hit you about halfway home and you'll end up, I pray, no, Lord, let them get home safely. Don't let them drive off in a ditch. But we need to learn how to function from this third heaven because it's there. I, I'm, I'm, oh, gosh, I, I got to finish this book. 
I'm still on chapter one, and, and I understand the delay because God has unfolded so much in the last few months. Sometimes when I, I get frustrated, but God pushes the pause button because he says, well, you have the genesis of the thing, but you need to wait for the plant to grow up so you can see the fruit of it so that you can actually write. You know, Don't write from a sprouting, write from the big tree when it comes up. And understanding how to function in the third heaven, how to function in the court of God, how to function our priesthood, this is all going to be in this book because the only time that we can really change things on the earth is not when we're functioning in the flesh. It's not when we're functioning by the soul. It's when we have that third heaven reality that we learn to not own, and, and that's part of the priesthood. It's preparing us. It's moving us through. It's, uh, well, you got to work the brazen altar. you got to work the, the, the brazen labor. Work it hard. Then you got to go into the holy place, fellowship with, the, with Jesus under the illumination of the Holy Spirit and have that, it, uh, that altar of intercession. Oh, you, you don't have this yet. yet. No, I've done, well, you've not taught on it yet. Well, I'm trying to get there. I'm going to get there just a little bit. Intercession is not when you're praying for yourself. You see, you get the, you get the old man crucified and burnt to a crispy critter out there on the brazen altar. You go to the Word and find out who the new man is. You go in there and you fellowship with Jesus under the anointing, and all of a sudden you find out everything that you need is in Him, and you step into that intercession part, and you begin looking beyond yourself and start praying for others. Because self has died. Self is lost in Christ. The Apostle Paul said that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. It's him living in me. Oh, none of this is in my notes, but we're going for it today. I, this thing's getting so big on the inside of me. We need to understand that the, the, the fruit of the flesh the, is the work of the iniquity force and the influence of the principalities and powers and demonic forces in this world. And the fruit of the Spirit is learning how to function in that third heaven. And the fruit of abiding there and fellowshipping with the King of kings and the Lord of lords and having His Spirit begin to, to help you and allowing your soul to be renewed to match your spirit only then can you enter into the holy of holies this is one of the things i shared on the sheila lazinski show is that there's this courtroom when you when you look in revelation 12 we're, we're, we're given this revelation how many know that we overcome him by the blood of the lamb by the word of our testimony and loving in our lives unto death everybody preaches that but nobody has a clue what it means because it's a courtroom we've had a prosecuting attorney whose official name in hebrew is hasatan that means pro prosecuting attorney he's making allegations accusations against the saints night and day we have Jesus interceding for us, but you know that unless you have special permission from the court, if, 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 if let's say that, that I, would, I would sue Michael Rodhouse, okay, and he's a no-show, his lawyer can be there, the, my lawyer can be there, but if he's a no-show, it defaults in favor of the other party. Default judgment. And see, the biggest problem we have had is we have access to that court because, because we will not deal with the flesh. We enter into that court and we feel convicted. And we can't make our petition before the king. But as you mature and you get everything under the blood, the Apostle Paul says we can walk boldly to the throne of grace that we can receive help in a time of need. And we can flip this thing on a dime and we discover the most guilty person in that courtroom is the prosecuting attorney. And we start to... Father, he's done this. How long are you going to put up with what he's doing? He's done this. He's done that. He's tried to find ways into my life. He's tried to find ways into my nation. He's tried to find ways into my family. And I come before your throne asking judgment. Now, why is it for a church 
full of people that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The minute you say judgment, they want to run like cockroaches when somebody turns the light on at night. It's because they don't have their life under the blood and they're still living carnal. They are spiritual meatheads. That's what carnal means. They're meatheads living like the world, thinking they're going to get to heaven and they're so filled with the fruit of the flesh and have no fruit of the Spirit, they can't stand in the court. Boy, this is coming out different than it was last time. I'm about to throw down my mic and everything else. Oh. I've heard emails back and some people call said, uh, you and Steve Quayle about burnt up the internet the other night. I sent him my, my notes and he went to pray and I went to pray and he kind of exploded and I was sitting there just doing little explosions all along the way. I told Mary, I, 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 you know, how I usually set, you know, because there's a video camera and you're trying to look nice. By the internet thing, I was grabbing that mic like this and I wanted to say, Murdoch, I'm coming for you. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> oh. Because heaven is, is putting an exclamation point on a lot of stuff. It's time to grow up. It's time to learn how to function in the court of God. It's time to take our priesthood seriously. And as long as, and I've been in the church for, uh, I remember as a little kid going and sleeping underneath the pew at Mary Ann Baptist Church. I remember that. And I never remember anybody teaching us how to operate in our priesthood. And the sacrifice of praise is one of many sacrifices that you can give. Not the only one. Your sacrifice is when you bring the carnal nature and you put it on the brazen altar and you sacrifice it and you let the fire of God consume it. That is your primary service to God, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And today, we want to praise Him, but the brazen altar has grown cold. Oh, you don't, you don't understand the significance of that. Jesus said, I come as a thief in the night. That is a Jewish colloquialism, idiom. The priests at night, you, on that, that fire for the brazen altar, you had to keep it going 24-7 because God gave the fire, you maintained the fire. Oh, there's a sermon in that right now. God gave you the fire. It's your responsibility to keep the fire. And a newbie would let the fire, they would stoke the fire and hoping they would, they would get, well, this looks like a big all night log, you know, and they'd throw that on there and they'd fall asleep. And the high priest would take coals because it went down to coals in a pan and he would put it on the individual's garments and they would get, start to really get warm and go into a coma just about until their clothes burst on fire and they had to streak through the streets of Jerusalem because they were asleep on duty and they weren't maintaining the fire of God. And let me tell you something, for the majority, the church is asleep and they have let the altar grow cold. There is no sacrifice going on except for a select few because we've not been taught. We have taken grace to the place that it replaces sacrifice. And it has done the kingdom a disservice. Because what happens when you don't do that the works of the flesh, the fruit, the manifestation of that seed when it comes up of the flesh. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresy, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, uh, revelings and the like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in past time, they that do such things, underline this in your Bible, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now there's a couple of places in the Word of God, we've already dealt with this, that the Apostle Paul said, if you do this, you can say you're saved all day long, you will never inherit the kingdom. Because saved people don't do these things. Now, I want to take this apart. Adultery. Now, most people, we, we, we kind of think we know what that means. Adultery is the breaking of the marriage company, cov uh, covenant and having sexual relationships with other, someone other than you're married to. This is a physical aspect of adultery, but there's also an adultery aspect of the soul. 
Your husband, Mary Lou Lake, is my best friend. She knows stuff about me ain't none of you ever going to find out. Thank God. <laughs> she knows all my secrets. She knows all my, my idiosyncrasies, and they are long. The, one of the largest scrolls in Mike Lake's life is his scroll of, of my quirks and stuff Jesus is still working on. And when I'm upset, she knows about it. When there's a blessing, she knows about it. She knows my hopes. She knows my aspirations. As a part of marriage covenant, that belongs to her. And we have too many that have what, what is known as a workplace wife or a workplace husband. That you're sharing everything with somebody in the workplace instead of sharing it with your husband or wife. That is psychological adultery. It is the breaking of the covenant. If your wife don't understand you, it's probably your fault. If your husband doesn't understand you, it's probably your fault. You can't understand when there's no communication and honest covenant communication. You can't do it. And we've had so many commit adultery that have never, ever uh, done that physically. Although, let me warn you, you start doing that in the workplace and you have, and you have this because that soul tie will begin extreme and that's how many affairs start i remember listening to a popular preacher that uh, uh but when it comes to this kind of sin he wouldn't tolerate in his life and he was approached by a woman in a hotel lobby wanting to know if he wanted to have a good time and that she would understand he looked at her his eyes got big started yelling jezebel and began running through the lobby, went straight to his room, called his wife and said, baby, you, you won't believe what just happened. <laughs> That's the way the kingdom is supposed to operate. Oh, come on now. Fornication. The Greek word that we derive this from is pornea. Pornography when you understand pornography, was birthed at the altar of Moloch and Ashtaroth because they would have group, large group sex parties around it. That's what Israel was doing around the golden calf when Moses came down the first time with the Ten Commandments. The King James is very poetic about it. They said then they went forth to play. Well, how do adults play? They weren't playing hopscotch. Okay. That this whole concept of this is, is derived from this concept of pornea that's connected to pagan worship. In fact, when you look at Corinth, people were talking about, Paul was talking about a woman having her hair long and, you know, and to cover it with a veil until it grows out and people don't understand what was going on. You had priestesses of the mystery religions of the oracles of Delphi that were getting saved. And that temple, they were prostitutes. That's what you got for your tithe, if you will, down at the oracles. That, that's, and that is, that is uh, absolutely foundational for all occult worship. That's why the pedophilia and, and the Thelemic stuff and all that is, is going rapid. And so they're getting saved and they're coming into the Christian fellowship with shaved heads, and you have another guy that's just hearing about Jesus, and he goes to church, if you will, and what does he think of a woman with a shaved head? I know this because we get that down there. And Paul basically said, listen, put a veil over your head representing your hair until your hair grows out because you don't want to confuse what we're doing here with that there. You see, context is king, and understanding the historical dynamics is king. But when you take, and so all of that that would go on in a pagan temple is, is connected to this word pornea. Now, it means to have illicit sexual intercourse, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism. Uh, it also deals with bestiality. That's all wrapped into this word. Uh, also, incest, uh, sexual intercourse with a divorced man or woman, the worship of idols, or the defilement of idols, because it's, it's hand in hand. Because there's, and whenever you have the 
physical fornication because it's involved with demonic presence and all the worship of these demonic gods from the pagan temple. There's also a spiritual fornication. That's why Christians need to be careful about what we do, especially when it comes to worship. If it's not derived from the Bible, let's not do it. Because there's, been a, there's a lot of things being embraced. And some of them can be innocent looking. Yoga is being taught in many churches today. And it is, a, it is a spiritual, physical exercise to awaken the kundalini spirit. And heaven sees it as fornication. Spiritual fornication. Because you're interacting with other spirits for enlightenment. That's what, the, that's what happened in Genesis chapter 3 when the Nahesh showed up. The Nahesh, the serpent, the seraph that became known as the serpent, and the whole thing of yoga is allowing that serpent to rise up and begin going up the spinal com column until it reaches your pituitary gland or your um, penal, uh, pineal gland for illumination. That's what that's all about. And the experts, the ones that originated it, I mean, you always go back to the manufacturer, okay? They say you cannot separate the exercises from the spirituality because every exercise is a manifested prayer to a deity. Now, we can have the same thing when it, when it comes to holidays. The Word of God says, do not learn the way of the pagan and don't you do it unto me. It's an abomination. So if it's not in the Bible, let's just, let's just not do it. Just stick with the Word. All the feasts of the Lord, they're not, they're not the feasts of the Jews in fact, there's some evidence that phrase was added to the writings of John. I mean, oh, John was a Jew. So he wouldn't write, the feast of them there are Jews. He would have said, the feast of us. <laughs> you know? And so there's, there's evidence, and there's some evidence that some of these things have been connected and added as editor's notes over the centuries to many of the texts. So we, we need to understand that porn is biblical fornication any application of it and it should not be among christians i remember one time james dobson when he was still in charge of focus on the family that they had this they had a huge convention and the manager came up and said i don't think we're going to have you next year kind of surprised me you know we packed the place everybody was good they said, now we've hosted the Republican Party, we've hosted the Democratic Party, but the most porn movies that have ever been bought was with the convention that we just had of all these Christian men and women. You add to that some of the technologies they have done with, with the frequencies and resonances around screens. And this is one of the things I'm going to get into when I'm in Branson. They have learned that they can create a magnetic field around any screen, a computer screen, your, your phone, your, your TV at home, that they overlace with porn and it makes it three times as addictive. There's a reason because it's the paganization. You cannot separate fornication from paganism. It goes hand in hand. It, and there's two sides of the coin, the spiritual and the physical. Now let's go on uncleanness. Uncleanness, physical, a, in a moral sense, the impurity of lust, luxurious, and impure motives. Luxurious living kind of sounds like Washington, D.C. There's, you see, there's what people don't realize is you can be surrounded by gold. You can be surrounded by limousines. You can be surrounded by influence and power of the world. And those that can see through third heaven realities, they see uncleanness. It's dirty. It's filthy. It is brought up with every vile thing that's brought up from the earth. And we need to... Uh, we need to do just the opposite because this is tied in uh, with, with wealth and affluence of the world. You know, when Lucifer came to Jesus and said, I can offer you all the kingdoms of the world, it was a real temptation. He could have. And he does that to men and women today and offers them power. 
and offers them wealth. And, all, and at the same time, he's contaminating their soul and he's bringing them deeper, deeper, deeper into darkness. So much so, they no longer look when you begin understanding the elite and what they're thinking. They're thinking, we want to reduce the population to, to 500 million or whatever. How many know that's them and not us? Because they look at us as subhuman. That's what we saw with the Nazis. That's why they were able to do what they did with the Jews and the blacks. And they said, well, the Aryan race is up here and we are a, we are a, a different species. They, they want to be homo superior, homo spiritual, or, or, or homo whatever. Homo nephilim. And they look at us like something that just needs to be purged from the planet. And that's the very spirit of globalism when you understand what's going on. It, it, it rivals in this uncleanness. They have plans in many parts of the world to say, we're going to take care of poverty and here's what we're going to do. You know, like, do you ever see those shipping crates? Like they have those shipping pods? They're going to make a little mini apartments for people, stick virtual reality on their on the, uh, VR goggles on their heads, making them think they live in mansions. And the whole time that they're living in that little cube world going in squalor, they're going to be extracting data from that to feed the singularity so that all of them can go to uncrowded beaches and enjoy reality. Because... Everybody else is down here. They're up here. When you look at the root word for Nimrod, uh, when a rabbi looks at Nimrod, which I don't think necessarily was his name, but more, more likely his title, because there were many ancient titles that can go with who he was. But uh, when a rabbi would look at that, he would say, he look at the Hebrew word and say, there's actually two Hebrew words here. And it translates this way. And he said, get down. I'm up here. You get down here. That's the spirit of Nimrod, and that is a spirit of uncleanness that we see, whether it's Washington, D.C., or it's the new techno elite that think we're so stupid we don't know what's going on when we do. A lot of us are waking up from their techno slumber. They're flowing in the, in the, in the works of the flesh. And we need to wake up its uncleanness. Now, the Bible, on the other side, God can give... Wealth to the righteous, and it's a whole different dynamic because they're not serving mammon. Mammon is actually a pagan god over wealth in the time of Jesus. Proverbs 11, 3 through 6 says, The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of the transgressors shall destroy them. Riches profit not in the day of wrath. Uh-oh! How many know that's coming? There's a wrath of God coming, and it's coming on those that are unclean. And their wealth is going to mean a thing. But I like the next part. But righteousness delivereth from death. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. Spot judgment. It's coming. Oh, here's a revelation. All this stuff that you should have been sacrificing on the brazen altar has a spiritual target on it. Okay? If you don't put it in the fire of sacrifice, the only alternative is the fire of persecution, but it's going it's to get burnt up one way or the other. Best do it now, believer. Lasciviousness. Unbridled lust, excess, wantedness, outrageousness, shamelessness, insolence. Boy, have you heard, all you got to do is look at Hollywood or look at some of the poli political stuff. And there's lasciviousness written all over it. But I also see it on a lot of Christian social media. And they call it a ministry. Well, if throwing dung is a ministry, how many know we're supposed to be sowing seeds of righteousness, not throwing dung? Okay. Idolatry. The worship of false gods, of the far most sacrificial feast held in honor of false gods. Uh oh. The winter solstice. 
spring equinox, feasts to pagan gods. In fact, that what I have found out when you start keeping watch of the occult, they have more feast days than Carter has liver pills. They're only about, uh, they're, they're only about 26 days apart because there'll, there'll be a, a gap and there'll be 13 on one side. Doc Marquis has done a wonderful teaching on this. And a lot of them have been adopted historically by the Catholic Church because that's their M.O., they put a Christian veneer on it, take control of it, it becomes theirs. We ought not be doing any of it. How I many know there's a Sabbath every week and there's seven feasts and they're all about Jesus, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he's getting ready to do. And we, we have the joy of celebrating those and it can be very extremely, powerfully Jesus-centric. There's two things goes on to me on the Day of Atonement. I make sure that I'm right with God, but in the back of my spirit, I'm thinking, the devil's got a thumping coming. The devil's getting a thumping coming. Because how many know when Jesus returns in the Valley of Armageddon, there is a thumping coming. And so I'm celebrating it, although I go in it with reverence. There is a, you know, at, when you have that end meal after fasting all day, there's two reasons for the celebration. Number one, you survived, Okay. Because the day of the Lord, Amos said, you know, everybody's wanting the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. I hear that a lot with the Christians. We're getting ready to do the day of the Lord. Amos said, dude, you don't know what you're asking. It's a dark day. There's be lucky anybody survives. You know, Amos said, I wouldn't wish that on my, on my darkest enemy. Because when the valley of Armageddon comes, there is no mercy. When he comes back, he's coming back in wrath. In wrath because he will be wroth. His vesture will be dipped in the blood of the rebellion of what has happened in the earth. My job is to get as many saved as possible so they don't have to face that and to get the Christians trained up so they'll be ready and so that we can do our job and get it done so he can come back. But we need to leave the idolatry alone. And it also says not only is, 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 it's also as a worship of mammon, worshiping wealth, and in plural, the vice is springing from idolatry and particular to it. Now, one of the words it uses here um, means insatiable greed for riches, inordinate, uh, miserly desire to gain and hoard wealth. We've never seen anybody like that, have we? That's all an adultery, an idolatry. Because if you worship mammon, that's what begins to happen is that begins manifesting in your life. Witchcraft. Pharmakia. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to say that there is going on with some medical drugs. There is some true pharmakia going on. But when you look at the history of, of witchcraft and pharmakia, they use drugs to open up the third eye. They use drugs to access higher levels in the second heaven. And what's amazing is when you read in the book of Revelation after the bottomless pit is opened up and all that great horde of transeugenic horde of whatever they are that come up that are, that are led by Apollyon. And they attack not the ones that are walking with God but the ones that have aligned themselves with the beasts to where they wish they could die but they can't. The Bible says when you read it in the Greek they would not, re they would not repent of their pharmakia. Their witchcraft, and a good portion of witchcraft is about opening up portals to higher spatial dimensions. Whether you do it metaphysically or you do it electronically, heaven considers it witchcraft. So it can be from CERN to the warlock down the street using blood as a way of opening up portals. It's still pharmakia. Hatred. Enmity, cause, uh, cause of enmity. Enmity is the state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. It also means hostility, animosity, antagonism, friction. Anybody see that with some protests going on today? There is hatred loose because the deeper, the further you get away from Jesus and the gospel and the more you get into darkness, the more you will hate everything and everyone around you. Strife, contention, wrangling, Facebook. Oh, that, wait a minute, that's not in the original Greek. 
But it is there. I see that all the time. Sedition. Dissension and diversion. There's a lot of, actually there's a lot of sedition going on right now in America. And if we, we would have some people in the Justice Department uh, kind of develop some spiritual manhood, there would be some sedition trials going on today, and I think we would be surprised who ended up there. I think there's sedition going on in our current president's own administration because they are globalists when they pretended to be nationalists. Heresies. Now listen to this. You know, everybody talks about heresy. This, what this guy's teaching is heresy. But heresy is the act of taking captive or storming a city is its number one definition. Teaching things that are wrong that bring people into captivity to something else. That which is chosen of body men following their own tenets of the Sadducees, of the Pharisees, of Christians, dissension arising from diversity of opinions and aims. But the devil uses heresies departing from this and many times heresy will either start in misinterpretation of Scripture or the traditions of men. And what it does is it takes them captive is the very definition of heresy. And that's the work of the flesh. Murder, murder, slander. Now Jesus actually takes this. I mean, how I many know there's a difference between killing, defending yourself, and murder? In the King James it says, Thou shalt not kill one of the Ten Commandments. It actually says in the Hebrew, thou shalt not commit murder. How many know when a soldier is fighting on the battlefield, that's not murder? If a police officer has to draw his weapon and fire to protect himself and to protect others, that is not murder. Murder is taking an innocent life because all of the, all of the works of the flesh are working in you and you're either stealing from somebody, you're trying to stop them to do something because of another agenda. Today we have a lot of people in the deep state, they are not killing, they are guilty of murder. Because they, they are taking a life without righteousness. I had someone this week email me and they, and they say, you know, my pastor says, why are you trying to fall off her? Because they stone people. You know, we don't stone people today. Absolute ignorance of the Torah that there was an entire process that you had to go before judges. You had to show there was reason for the penalty of death. In fact, the very concept of the laws that we have in America and the process was drawn out of the Torah. When we see that they stoned Stephen the way that they did, they violated the Torah. When they captured Jesus at night and had a trial by night, they violated the law of God when they did it. It was a kangaroo court done at night to hide their own sins. Complete violation of the Word of God. And we're seeing things like that today, aren't we? How did I get off in that wild rabbit? I don't know. Let's get back here to murder. Jesus actually takes it to a whole new level. You know, sometimes you can take a person's life away without ever physically harming them. You see, the only thing that you really have is your name and your reputation. Okay? So Jesus expands murder to character assassination. That's why apologists have to be very careful. Because there's a lot of self, there are a lot of self-appointed apologists that are not apologists; they are character assassins, and they call it a ministry. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, "Thou shalt not kill," and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment, though committing murder. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Hatred. See, it's a fruit of the. It's a working of the flesh without a cause. Whoever shall say to his brother, Rekha shall be in danger of the council, and whosoever say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. And how many know we don't know what Rekha means? You have to look it up. It means you're good for nothing. Planting the seeds that instead of you're created in the image of God and God has a purpose or plan for you, well, you're a good for nothing. You're never going to amount to anything. Jesus said, you better be careful. Don't you do that. 
Don't you plant that in that kid's head or plant that in that person's head. Because if, if, we were, if we were moving biblically, you could be brought before the council and held in contempt for what you did. And let me tell you something. The third heaven court agrees with the words of Jesus. And maybe one of the reasons that we're running from that third heaven court is we're, we already know we're guilty before we get there because we've not changed and we've not brought it under the blood. Drunkenness. Now, I got really deep here in the Greek. I wanted to really find out what drunkenness meant. And so I dig deep. Are you ready? It means drunk. Sometimes the drunk can not come out of a bottle, but maybe a pill bottle or by a reefer. It's to get drunk to escape reality. When the, when the kingdom of God calls us to hit reality head on and change it for the kingdom. Revelings. This one is interesting. Reveling to carouse. And I know sailors that used to do that, military that used to do that quite often. I used to see it when I lived in the barracks. But listen to this. It is a riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows. Let me know this was written a long time ago. This definition. There were frolicsome fellows who after supper paraded through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity, and singing and playing uh, before the houses of male and female friends, hence used generally a feast and drinking parties that are, that are protracted late into the night and indulged in revelry. That's the origin of Christmas caroling. Selah. God has called us to something higher. We are called to walk in a new kingdom. Functioning from the third heaven. Functioning from our spirit man. Functioning from the commandments of God. The way that Jesus showed us how to walk in them. And then moved on the inside of us to empower us to walk in them. When we look at these things going on in our life, we should target them and say, I will no longer tolerate these things in my life. And I take them to that brazen altar. And I have. And there's, there's a reason there, there is a horn on all four corners of that brazen altar. Because sometimes you've got to tear that bad boy. You've got to tie him down. Because he will squeal and he will scream your name and tell you how much you need them and how much you have depended upon them your whole life and instead you need to tie them down until there's nothing left but ash we got to have that I'm going to throw in something else too can I, can I do this as one of my pet peeves I don't believe in children's church I believe children should be raised and be familiar with the anointing of God. And so when they're still in their mama's arms, they need to be in service. They need to be, from, from the time on up, my grandsons, all they know is the anointing. And let me tell you something, if somebody got behind a pulpit and there was no anointing there, as young as they are, they would know it because it's what they have always known. But we have children today that were entertained in children's church so that mom and dad could have their break that they were paying their tithe for. And what they have done is they have disenfranchised the next generation from the anointing of God. Come on now. How many know babies cry, but I have found in church so do adults. There's been sometimes I've been preaching real good. I've seen people bite their lips because they want to cry. It's okay. The church should be family. Let's, let's, let's quit doing all this modern stuff and, and get back to the, the truth. And get back to exposing our children to worship, exposing our children to the anointing. So when they're old, they will not depart from it. Because there's a yearning on the inside for the supernatural, and if they don't get it in church, they'll start looking to Harry Potter and a bunch of other junk for it. And how I many know the other side is really quick to give it to them? And it's a poison. And that's what this is about. Every one of, the, of these workings of the flesh will destroy your life. 
It will destroy your relationships. It will destroy your health. It will destroy everything that you hold dear. But what we're going to get into the next section is the manifestation of not only abiding in the Holy Spirit, but living from your spirit man from a third heaven reality. It brings life, and the Apostle Paul makes this declaration. There is no such law against it. In fact, it's encouraged by the commandments of God. And it brings healing and restoration, and it begins turning your life around when you begin walking by the Spirit of God. And that's what we want more than anything else. Now, Father, we just thank you for the word today. Father, we thank you that it will not return to you void. But, Father, it's going to accomplish what you have sent it to do. And, Father, I believe that there is an anointing on this teaching, Father, to cause us to crucify the works of the flesh so that we have spiritual territory for the, for the fruit of your spirit in our lives because it is the very character of Jesus that he went to the cross to bring us. And Father, let us be filled with Jesus. Let us decrease so that he can increase in our lives. In Jesus' name.